the speech. Okay. Yeah, just let me make a, a brief remark. Yeah, it's a pleasure for us to have uh, Dr. Uh, Nick uh, Butch from NIST as our condensed matter speaker. Actually, I knew about Nick's work quite a few years ago when we were working on bismuth selenide topological insulator. I read uh, some of his very interesting uh, papers early on when the you know topological insulator was uh, just uh, like a you know a new field, and more recently I noticed his uh, work on topological superconduct uh, superconductor. So we thought this, uh, which seems very uh, exciting new development in the, this uh, big area of a topological material, and uh, it's a good opportunity that uh, we uh, have him as our speaker to talk to the department. Um, uh, with, uh, without uh, further ado, uh, Nick, why don't you uh, take it away? Yeah. All right, yeah, and thank you for the invitation. I'm always uh, happy to talk about uranium ditelluride. Um, and it's, uh, it's. I guess I, I should say now, um, I, I am trying, I am trying to uh, include a lot of introductory, well, not a lot, enough introductory material to make this understandable. Um, but if you want to interrupt me and if I can, and I actually catch it, um, I'm happy to take questions in the middle. So if something, if you have a question in the middle, please uh, let me know um, so that, you know, it doesn't go unanswered until the end. Okay, so yeah, the talk today is exploring the limits of spin triplet superconductivity. Um, and I'm going to be discussing our, uh, actually, I was going to say recent pressure work. There are our recent, uh, recently published papers, but also something going back a couple of years. Um, and the people who contributed, um, and maybe in some ways are, are really most responsible for, for uh, what I'm going to talk to you about, um, uh, include Sheng Ran, who was a postdoc of mine. Uh, and he is, uh, you know, he, he was the one who synthesized these materials and we discovered superconductivity in this actually in 2018. He is now assistant faculty at Wash U in St. Louis. Uh, we work very closely with the Jean-Pierre Paglions group at the University of Maryland. And um, in this case, um, a, lot, a lot of what I'm going to be talking to you or showing you um, is uh, done at the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory, where we had support services and actually a lot of work done by Dave Graff. So he, he did a, a lot of uh, really great work on this, too. And then th some theory support uh, from Andrei Navidomsky at Rice University. And then I have a stat here. So um, as of several months ago, um, there were 48 publications. So this is on Web of Science, remember somewhat conservative. So in only, you know, less than three years, there, this, this, um, this topic, one material has, has taken off quite a bit. All right. Um, so short outline, uh, we'll talk about basic properties of the material. I'll introduce to you a high magnetic field superconductivity, what is that, which is actually one of the essential um, properties or, or behaviors uh, of UT2. Um, we'll talk about topology and superconductivity a little bit, and then uh, sort of the crux of the talk, which is what pressure does to this material. Um, the three papers that I'm kind of highlighting here are the pressure work that was done um, by our group. So let's, uh, let's get started. And I apologize if it's overly simplistic, and I also apologize if I gloss over things. So. Um, Stop me if I, if I need to, to explain anything. So uh, we know that superconductors in general, um, they only operate, they're only superconducting below a certain temperature called the critical temperature, right? And in many, in most cases, it's pretty low. Uh, for example, mercury is below 4K, a niobium tin, which is a commercially uh, useful material is below slightly uh, less than 20 Kelvin. And the other thing that we're going to be talking about a lot that also limits superconductivity is magnetic field. And so for simple type one superconductors like mercury, there is a critical field and it's typically pretty small. Um, for things that you would make uh, superconducting magnets out of, that field has to be pretty large or, or you know, you wouldn't have a useful uh, magnet. And so that can be, let's say, upwards of 25 Tesla or, of course, even higher. Um, like, for example, in the copper oxide superconductors, the ITC superconductors. In that case, 
Um, we're showing here a YBCO as an example um, where the critical limiting field of superconductivity uh, can be 150 Tesla. Okay, so say so that's pretty pretty large. Unfortunately, we can't really make uh, magnets out of YBCO yet. Um, although finally, after 30 years, uh, copper uh, cuprate superconductors are being slowly deployed. Um, so the first kind of uh, uh, magnets are being made out of them. So second point is, well, along for the ride. So if you have something that has a high upper critical field, it's typically also going to have a high uh, critical temperature, in this case, 90 Kelvin. Of course, this is useful, right? We want things to work at higher temperatures. But the point here uh, summarized in this, in this plot is that if we just take the known superconductors, um, not including the high pressure ones, which is a if you know about them, um, that we're not going to really touch on them in this talk. Um, but we can break these up into several classes. And let me see if I can get my pointer. Because I'm happy with uh, an arrow, but people like dots. So here we go. Cuprates um, tend to have high transition temperatures, and then they'll extrapolate to really high upper critical fields. The more recent iron superconductors fall in this intermediate range, let's say 50 Kelvin transition. Um, and then our, our standard conventional BCS type superconductors sit in this corner. And I, I say here, ratios are typically one to one or two to one. And so just bear this in mind as we go forward. All right, let's talk about uranium ditelluride. This is a nice little map that was made by the NIST press office. Uh, I'm not gonna explain it to you, but essentially they were saying, hey, we were exploring uh, new uh, territory. And so one of the things I'm going to try to do is impress upon you that uh, UT2 is uh, weird. It's very unusual. And it it's unusual for many reasons. So uh, bear with me. This is what the crystals look like. I think it's always important to let people know. We actually manufacture or synthesize them here at the University of Maryland. They're, they're made by a process called chemical vapor transport. Um, on the left is a, is a photograph of what uh, crystals would look like in a sealed fused quartz tube. So they're grown in basically an empty, uh, not an empty, but in a glass tube um, that's got iodine in it that's used as a transport agent. And a grid here, for example, is a millimeter grid. So you kind of get a sense for what the standard size of crystals is and what their typical morphology is. Actually, typical is the wrong word here. I picked some nicer looking ones. They're not the biggest we can grow, but um, for, for pictures, it's always good to do that. All right, and the crystal structure of uranium ditelluride is orthorhombic. And um, these blue atoms are uraniums and the gray ones are telluriums. There are two different tellurium sites. And it's sort of, um, there's like, there, there's a, there are two motifs really you could think about here. One is a, a chain of uranium atoms or uranium and tellurium atoms that are a zigzag. And the other one is uh, rectangular uh, plaquettes of tellurium atoms. So for those of you who love uh, transition metal dichalcadronides, this, even though it has the same stoichiometry, is not that. It, is, it, it doesn't have the same mechanical properties. And we're talking about a very different uh, form of superconductivity. Uh, nonetheless, um, there, is, there, there has been this notion that due to sort of the, these uh, rectangular plaquettes, um, that the structure looks like it might be two-dimensional. And also, uh, th this idea comes from uh, standard first principles calculations, like uh, just various flavors of LDA, that tell you that you have rectangular Fermi surfaces in the AB plane. Um, now, photo emission finds these things, but also finds additional uh, pockets that really aren't accounted for in any first principles calculations. And, and frankly, there have been quite a few. Um, this is not really so mysterious because um, F electrons in general, and uranium has unpaired F electrons, um, they are very difficult theoretically uh, to work with. And so um, while there are definitely ways to do this, um, it's not really a surprise that um, the agreement isn't, um, isn't the best. So unlike, for example, uh, topological insulators where 
with some confidence you can calculate band structures. Um, the important things that we, we talk about, the low energy features that are near the chemical potential are notoriously hard to get from first principles calculations. Um, now this, okay, so given that there might be some three-dimensional pockets, and again, despite the inclination to expect that there might just be rectangular Fermi surfaces, if we look at the temperature dependence of the electrical resistivity, um, we note that first, that if we're um, passing current along uh, the main crystallographic directions, then there isn't a huge variation in the resistivity. It tells us already that scattering isn't that um, anisotropic. But we also notice that the temperature dependence is not what you would get from a typical metal. Um, in fact, if we're looking just along A and B, which are similar, although their magnitudes are different, you'll notice that there's a negative slope to um, the resistance as a function of temperature. And that is typical of heavy fermions. That is, um, materials in which the F electrons hybridize with the conduction bands with fairly low energy scales. And um, so the, nothing jumps out here. Um, but the C-axis has a visibly different um, temperature dependence. It has a peak that I will say, at least right now, we don't completely understand. Um, but um, I just bear, bear in mind that uh, what these shapes are, um, we use electrical resistivity as a probe for phase transitions, and it's a, it's a rather quick way to, to interrogate the system. So I'll be showing you a lot of resistivity data in this talk. All right, so most people um, don't care about the normal state so much and are interested in superconductivity. So um, UT2 was not, I mean, the material itself was not discovered by our group, but superconductivity was. So UT2 has been known for decades now. Um, there have been people who study just uranium binary compounds. And, uh, but uh, two things, uh, basically, let's say I, I speculate kept this discovery um, from happening until recently. The first is that the transition temperature is 1.6 Kelvin. And so um, you need to be looking for it uh, because even our workhorse instruments typically made by quantum design like PPMSs and such, uh, really only operate down to 1.8 Kelvin. Um, the second thing is actually that sample, that the superconductivity is, uh, depends on how you make the samples. And so it is possible to make non-superconducting samples. Nonetheless, um, in March of 2018, so already over three years ago, um, we found that there is uh, the typical hallmarks of bulk superconductivity. Uh, that is a, a, big, a big transition in AC magnetic susceptibility, which indicates Meissner screening, that is the superconductor is expelling magnetic field and um, the electrical resistivity goes to zero. All right. And so um, if we study the field dependence of, the, of this superconducting transition, um, on the left, I, I have a plot of the upper critical field. So as a function of temperature and field here, um, along the three main directions. And you'll notice that it's anisotropic, that maybe by itself is not all that special, but that um, along one of the directions is basically a vertical line. And superconductivity disappears or is killed at 35 Tesla. And that's what's being shown on the right. So one thing to marvel at is that you can get a zero resistance state all the way up to 35. That's, that's a, a pretty nice data set. Very cool from my perspective. The second thing is in the inset, is that actually the, 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 the disappearance of superconductivity happens at the same time that there is a step in the magnetization. And so that's telling you actually that um, the superconducting state isn't necessarily even being limited by field, in this case, by the so-called orbital limit, but rather by a change in the magnetic or electronic ground state. Second fact um, that's relevant here is that even the lower uh, field, the lower upper critical fields along, let's say, the A axis, these fields are bigger than the paramagnetic limit. And this tells us something important already about the superconductivity. Because in typical superconductors, we consider um, pairing between electrons with opposite spins. And that means that it's some sufficiently high magnetic field, Zeeman coupling is going to overtake. Uh, superconductivity, and it will flip one of the spins, and that is going to break the Cooper pair. That doesn't happen in UTE2. 
all the upper critical fields are higher than that value. Um, and so what it indicates immediately with, of course, caveats, you know, there might be ways around this limit, but um, this is a pretty sure, uh, let's say as sure as one can be in these kind of situations, this is a pretty good evidence that we're talking about spin triplet superconductivity. That is a case where the electron spins are parallel instead of anti-parallel. And a, a system like this doesn't have a Zeeman, a Zeeman effect uh, limiting it. Okay, so um, if we want to talk about uh, what happens then uh, with uh, what as a function of field in this material, uh, let's look at effective zero temperature phase diagram. And so um, in the so field along the vertical axis and then field angle. So with the, with the main crystallographic directions here lab, labeled um, on, on the horizontal axis. And so the lower field superconductivity, which is low field in the sense that it com compared to the others, um, below about 15 Tesla, if you were just mapping out the upper critical field angle dependence, you might think you had a typical three-dimensional superconductor. Then you would come near the B-axis within a pretty narrow window. So between five and 10 degrees deviation uh, off of the B-axis, you have this finger of superconductivity that extends up to 35 Tesla. So what I showed you uh, just now. Um, for those who worry about like, how does one measure this typically, it was actually pretty difficult or it took some work to figure this out because of standard kind of misalignment issues. If one goes to the National High Magnetic Field Laboratory with a sample and you think you're aligned along B, it doesn't really take a lot to knock that alignment off by five degrees, especially when you're just starting out and you're kind of doing everything by eye. Um, so it took a little while to figure out what's going on. Uh, the other thing is that there's this pink phase it's called FP. It's this where the ma uh, magnetic step occurs. And so there is basically this magnetic transition that has this shape. Its lowest field is along B. And then, which you probably read already, is that there is this um, really high field reentry phase that uh, exists above 40 Tesla and maybe even above 60. Um, again, due to the possibility that we don't have everything lined up. We call it a reentrant phase because if one follows this red line, you're superconducting, then at higher field, as you would expect, superconductivity goes away. But then as you wouldn't expect, at even higher field, superconductivity returns. And um, so Lazarus, of course, is known for being uh, raised from the dead. And the term Lazarus was coined by the Maglab press office. I think it's appropriate. The thing is, Reentrant superconductivity is not a new topic or a new concept here, but this field scale is um, the highest that we know of. And so if we want to take a closer look at this, excuse me, um, I'm just plotting here the temperature dependence now along some slices. So angle of 23.7 uh, or 33 degrees using two different measurements, but let's just focus on the resistance. Um, so if you look at the data, you see superconducting, not superconducting, superconducting. So that's the reentrant superconductivity. And if we plotted uh, several of these scans as a function of temperature, you'll note that superconductivity looks like it goes away also near uh, 1.5 Kelvin. So this is a phenomenon with a similar energy scale. And a question that is outstanding is, how does this happen? What physical mechanism um, makes this possible? And the sort of um, at the forefront of what we know about are mechanisms that rely on lower effective dimensionality of the electrons, which are basically we're looking for ways that we can suppress the orbital limit. And these are known, but this is an open question. How do you do that? OK, so um, if we want to stop asking questions and just marvel at the beauty of this thing, I repeat this uh, plot that I showed you earlier and just um, want to say, hey, look at that. UT2, so on this temperature scale, is essentially a delta function near zero, okay? And um, plotted on this scale, it's, it's really just, I think, emphasizes how unusual this material is. Something with such a low transition temperature shouldn't, shouldn't go to such high fields. Um, and so there's already something just qualitatively remarkable about it. So let's talk a little bit about what that super like what what this might be and so as i mentioned reentrance is not 
uh, necessarily a new topic. Um, it's seen in, in uh, several different types of uh, superconductors, but one of the most uh, seemingly relevant um, is are, are the su ferromagnetic superconductors. And you know there aren't there isn't like a huge long list of them. Uh, the ones that I'm comparing to here are uranium rhodium germanium and uranium cobalt germanium. And you might say, wow, they're also uranium compounds. That may not be a coincidence, uh, an accidental coincidence rather. Um, and so um, I mentioned that there's some sample dependence to some of these properties. It's not, we're actually still working on, because these are expensive measurements, you, you know, not getting excellent statistics by comparing hundreds of samples. Um, but it's possible that the upper critical field curves measured by us are different from those, let's say, measured by uh, our friends and friends. Um, but you see reentrant superconductivity also along the b-axis in some cases, um, whereas as I showed you, there were uh, there's a curve where maybe it's not really reentrant, just vertical. This compares, um, let's say, favorably or is reminiscent of the upper critical field curves in this ferromagnetic superconductors. Here's for the rhodium compound. You'll notice the superconductivity, no superconductivity, and then a pocket. And then for the cobalt compound, this kind of S shape. Um, these things tend to happen where the ferromagnetism dies because the field is, al is along a direction that's uh, uh, perpendicular to the axis of polarization. So um, the main difference between these two compounds, as I'll come to, is that the ferromagnetic superconductors actually are ferromagnetic. Another similarity, so we're put, trying to push this analogy, is that um, these uranium compounds also have this zigzag motif crystallographically. So it's very suggestive. And why would we care? Well, because ferromagnetic superconductors, I won't say generically, but they have a pretty good shot at harboring topological uh, states. And um, here's just a quote from this paper by Sao and Tawari. Um, that the equal spin pairing that is uh, having these spins parallel generically supports Majorana surface states. And of course, you've probably heard many times by now that these could be used for fault tolerant quantum computing. So is UT2 a topological superconductor? That's a great question, right? So I, um, for your uh, convenience, uh, assembled a list of, let's say three things that Three, three uh, requirements for uh, this material being a topological superconductor. It, it should have surf chiral surface states, such as these Majorana modes. Um, it should break time reversal symmetry, and it should have a two component a complex order parameter. So with the, in collaboration with the Madhavan group at Urbana, um, who did the scanning tunneling microscopy study, uh, we. I want to just highlight here because the, the paper has, of course, more things in it. But um, that they found is that when they uh, looked at the samples, that they had these long um, steps on the sample surface, and they could be broken down into basically two different categories. One that's n-type or p-type. Basically, does it go up? Is it a step up or a step down? Um, and when they tunneled into them, let's say there's two things that they saw. One is that there's a tunneling spectrum that has features that are on the order of the superconducting uh, gap energy, which is great because that means they're sensitive to the superconductivity. And the second thing is that um, these spectra have opposite handedness. That is, if one is tunneling into the p-type uh, edge, then um, the, the tunneling spectrum has a certain shape. And then if you're in the n-type edge, it has the opposite shape. And this is true regardless where on the surface it is. So as long as it's a step up, it looks like one thing. As long as it's a step down, it looks like the other. And so while the details of this are not necessarily perfectly understood, um, this is already by definition chiral. Number two and three are uh, published just recently in the science paper. Uh, number two is from uh, in a collaboration with the Capitolna Group at Stanford with their uh, optical Kerr setup. Um, you'll see the temperature, de uh, temperature dependence of the Kerr angle, and it becomes non-zero in the superconducting state. That tells you that there's a spontaneous moment in the superconducting state that tells you that it breaks time reversal symmetry. Um, and along with that uh, work uh, that was uh, driven by, let's say, Ian Hayes, postdoc in um, JP Paglione's group are that you can resolve the uh, specific heat 
transitions into two separate steps. And pretty much all the samples, not pretty much, in all of the samples that we make by the CVT process. So this is actually a contentious issue. And if I have time, I'll, I'll touch on it a little bit at the end. But these, um, we've essentially checked the boxes. So we, we believe we have a, a pretty strong case here now that we have something that looks like a topological superconductor. All right. And so in keeping with that, there have been many um, theoretical proposals now for what the uh, superconducting order parameter could be. Um, now, not all of them are actually uh, topological uh, states or topological, non trivial they don't all have, have non-trivial topology, but some of them definitely do. And then uh, what I'm showing here on the right is just uh, a field temperature dependence uh, possibility for uh, how these different uh, order parameters might evolve. And so that, that matches kind of the, the rough uh, morph, I was going to say morphology, but sort of the topology, the shape of the upper critical field curve, at least along the p-axis. Right. So uh, now that we've talked about the flavor of superconductivity, we want to pair it with some discussion of the flavor of magnetism. Okay, Wine and cheese, for those of you who are paying attention. Um, the chemical cousins of uranium ditelluride are ferromagnets. So if we just look at isoelectronic compounds, uh, with the caveat that they actually have different crystal structure, um, uranium diselenide, uranium disulfide are either ferromagnetic or almost ferromagnetic. Uh, neither of them is a particularly good metal. Um, and so we would already expect naively that UTE2 would also be like that. In fact, if we look at the specific heat, uh, plotted here um, is C over T versus T squared, in particular to emphasize the electronic component and also, um, in, in this case, usually to show the phonon contribution. But anyway, um, you'll see that up until about 10 Kelvin, which uh, would be where we would expect things to hide, we don't see any uh, anomalies in the, in the specific heat. The one that you will see is the superconducting one um, that's uh, that's prominent there. Um, and everything about it, that is, if we consider the susceptibility, magnetic susceptibility, the heat capacity, and the resistivity, these are what I would call typical heavy fermion values. So even though they don't look like a simple metal, there is nothing really that jumps out at you that says, hey, this is a weird thing. Um, if we look at the magnetic susceptibility measured here in a squid, so what I'm showing you here are 1.8 Kelvin data. Um, in the inset, so that's the field dependence, so quasi-linear. And then at the temperature dependence, you'll notice that it is anisotropic. Um, the A-axis is what we call the easy axis. It, it's just, you know, it's got the highest magnetic susceptibility. Um, if we look along the B-axis, there is actually a turnover uh, below about 40K or so. And then the C-axis is kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, the thing is, I just spent a lot of time talking to you about ferromagnetic superconductors. Um, also saying, hey, this material looks like it should be a ferromagnet, but it is almost certainly not. Um, the, the squid magnetometry tells us that if there were an ordered moment, it would be teeny tiny and, you know, realistically not worth talking about. So this is just placing limits on that. And in addition to that, um, neutron scattering also tells us that there are no magnetic phase transitions that are observable, like by neutron scattering down to um, temperatures right above it. In fact, actually more recent ones also uh, are consistent with this. So down into the superconducting state, there are no indications that there's magnetic order. Okay, um, on the other hand, there are other probes that we can throw at this material. One of them is uh, looking is muons. And if you look at muons uh, spin relaxation measurements, USR, um, there's, there's very strong evidence for strong magnetic fluctuations. And I say ferromagnetic here um, because of several reasons. but um, for those of you who are familiar with what MUSR is typically used for in, um, let's say, nominal time reversal symmetry breaking superconductors, MUSR can be is sensitive to internal fields, and in some cases is you can be used as evidence again for what the curve data showed in this material, which is that there is a spontaneous moment when you cool into the superconducting state. Unfortunately, in this material, we don't see that. And the reason is interesting. It's because actually there are dynamic uh, fluctuations that 
would mask that signal. They're actually very strong. And if you look at the temperature dependence, you don't, while, while the, um, it looks like the fluctuation, you know, the intensity is getting stronger as you cool, you don't see any discontinuities at the, at the superconducting critical temperature. Uh, moreover, the temperature dependence of um, some of the features basically is consistent with uh, theories of ferromagnetic uh, critical behavior. And so this um, is suggestive, again, that these are ferromagnetic fluctuations. Um, but it isn't all that cut and dried. And as I mentioned, there's, there's more recent neutron scattering data, and in particular, the inelastic, that is when you're looking at energy transfer, um, has observed um, strong signals at inelastic, uh, at, of course, at, at finite energy transfer at non-zero momentum transfer, which would be um, consistent with antiferromagnetic fluctuations. And so um, in the other corner uh, in favor of ferromagnetic uh, type interactions are the temperature dependence of uh, the core rotation. And that seems to suggest actually that the normal cores that, that, are, that the core rotation measurement is sensitive to actually are polarized. That is, they have an enhanced paramagnetic response as one might expect if one were approaching a ferromagnetic uh, transition. And so this debate is still open. Uh, I will note for those of you who are more familiar with this idea that the concept of a spin triplet superconductor that is driven by antiferromagnetic fluctuations is a new one. I'm sorry, that doesn't mean that it hasn't been considered, but it is not what one would typically expect. And so it kind of challenges our understanding if that turns out to be true. Okay, so if I ignore the, the controversy, um, this is the kind of uh, conceptual phase diagram that I would like to uh, imprint in you. And of course, with the caveat that it might not be quite correct, but if we look at the uranium superconductors um, on, the, on the horizontal axis, we're basically comparing the ones that order ferromagnetically and UT2 does it. So as the moment gets smaller and the transition temperatures go down, they become stronger superconductors. So it's tempting to think about UT2 as the end member of a series of uranium uh, ferromagnetic superconductors. Okay, and uh, now to what I want to focus this talk on, and which is uh, what applied pressure does to this material. And it wouldn't be an interesting topic, I would argue, unless lots of weird stuff was happening, and that's what I'm going to talk about. By weird, I mean things, I guess, that you wouldn't necessarily expect, or I wouldn't anyway. So um, going back to a paper published last year, um, which, of course, uh, reports work done the year before, um, I'm, I'm showing here on the left the temperature dependence of the resistance, um, here plotted at different pressures. So this is in completely in zero field. And you know, I, I uh, talked about the electrical resistivity uh, several slides ago, and I wanted to just say here, um, this experiment was done with a current flowing in an intermediate direction. And so it, it doesn't necessarily look like uh, what you would expect from the previous slides. Of course, it's also here shown below 20K. So what do I want to focus on is that um, as you apply pressure, you'll notice that the super, well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about the colors, uh, we'll talk about something that's easier to see than the colors uh, on, the, on the right, but um, superconductivity is enhanced, and then at some critical pressure um, around uh, 1.35, let's say GPA, it disappears. And if we take this data set and plot it on the right, you'll notice that there's an, up, an increasing trend. So 1.6 Kelvin we start, and then we get up to about 3 Kelvin. And then at about 1.4 GPA or so, uh, superconductivity goes away. And on the other side is what we believe is long-range magnetic order. And there's another energy scale that comes down, which I'm calling hybridization. But this is, um, it looks like the so-called condo uh, lattice energy scale, that is the hybridization between F electrons or uh, on the uraniums and the kind of more conventional P or, or S derived uh, conduction electrons is weakening. And this is also in a very hand wavy qualitative manner. It's because basically it's some feature in the resistance that is disappearing. Um, if we and we also looked at the field dependence, the magnetic field dependence of these. So there's some fairly complicated data to look at, and uh, I basically wanted you to focus on this blue square here um, for the following reason: uh, field 
and, uh, and then resistance here. So we're talking about um, data taken at constant temperature. Let's look at point three Kelvin, for example. It's not superconducting, and then I apply field, and then it becomes superconducting. And then, it, of course, at higher field, that goes away. So again, we see reentrant superconductivity, superconductivity that's actually stabilized by magnetic field as opposed to being destabilized by it. Of course, eventually it dies. But the point is, magnetic field is somehow inducing superconductivity. And uh, if we plot this on, again, another phase diagram, field versus temperature, um, we see these magnetic transitions or things we're assigning to the magnetic transition. And you'll notice that this bubble of superconductivity lives kind of where the magnetism goes away, reminiscent of what we saw with the ferromagnetic superconductors, albeit at a lower energy scale. And then at the edges and also in these intermediate regions, if we look carefully at the resistance, let's say here's a function of field, we'll notice that it's hysteretic, which is indicative of there being a first order phase transition associated with it. Um, and so we don't understand this completely, um, but this actually happens at more than one pressure value. In fact, I want to stitch these together into this phase diagram. Pressure is on the horizontal axis, right? So what we're doing is we're tuning the system some way, and then your conventional field and temperature dependence. At ambient pressure, you have our uh, superconductor. Remember that the field is not along B, so this is not some ridiculously high value that we're talking about right now. It's laboratory scale. Um, but as we cross this critical pressure and we have a magnetic ordered phase, um, instead of having superconductivity at low field, now we only have superconductivity in finite field. And we see this kind of same motif, magnetic order, and then at lower temperatures and over some finite field range, um, superconductivity, and then it'll eventually go away. So uh, this does not live in isolation really. Um, actually in this slide, um, I wanted to emphasize something, sorry, that, that that segue was not quite right for this slide. Um, I want to also mention that uh, there is a measurement technique that we didn't perform, but that's AC calorimetry, and that is feasible to do under pressure. And it's important in this case, because despite the fact that I just showed you what might seem very complicated, it's even worse. There is more than one superconducting transition in the low, uh, on the low pressure side, beneath the critical pressure. There, is a, there are at least two different superconducting phases. Um, we know this from calorimetry because there are anomalies that in the in the specific heat that separate them. Moreover, if you look at the field dependence of this, um, there might actually be four. So depending on how you count, this is a pretty complicated system. We don't have it all um, understood yet by any stretch of the imagination. It's just very rich. There's a lot to look at. Okay. Um, and I was going to say I don't actually have the slide on here, but just in words. Um, similar reentrant superconductivity has been seen along other field directions by other groups. So what I'm showing you, some semblance of that might actually be a fairly general feature of, um, of this material, which is already by itself kind of, kind of weird and interesting. But let's, um, let's focus on what I think is a little bit um, simpler to, to digest. Let's go back to the high field phase diagram and look along the B-axis. So I'll re remind you that this is where the 35 Tesla upper critical field limit is um, and where the system transitions into a different magnetic state at higher field. So we want to apply pressure to see what happens to uh, this energy scale, essentially. Okay, so on the left, just as a reminder, um, you're looking at a data set where when you're perfectly aligned along B, this red curve is zero, 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 and then the resistance becomes finite. Let's compare to the sets on the right, which are taken at uh, different pressure steps or different pressure values. Um, for those of you um, paying close attention, uh, the units here are in kilobar, not, uh, not gigapascal. Um, 10 kilobar equal, equals one gigapascal. So the conversion here would be 0.4 GPA, for example. So you'll notice, uh, again, qualitatively in resistance, this big jump, just as we see here. Um, that, and this is just the temperature dependence of it. You'll notice though, as you apply pressure, this jump gets suppressed to lower fields and eventually it's no longer there. Okay. Um, it's easier to look at when we stitch these together, in this case of the contour plots. Um, shown here on the right side, um, 
you'll see this transitions at 30. On the vertical axis here is temperature. And so it's fairly temperature independent um, in, in the range of the superconductivity. Um, you have uh, maybe a funny concave shape and there's reentrance in this uh, in the superconductivity. And in addition, what we've delineated here with the yellow squares is SC2, a second superconducting phase that is noticed only in diode oscillator measurements. This is contactless resistance or actually in some sense penetration depth. So it's a fairly subtle feature. We would not be able to see this in resistivity because everything is already zero resistance. It might show up in calorimetry, but we don't have the we, we don't have that experimental capability. And so what's happening is that as you apply pressure, um, the field at which this field polarized state uh, is induced is lowered, as I said before, and the superconductivity can no longer be tracked, this, 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 uh, this separation between the two phases. So uh, 14 kilobars is already near the critical pressure, and you'll see that it's got this sort of trend. So let's put it together onto a zero temperature phase diagram. Pressure and field. This field, this critical, this uh, metamagnetic or field polarized transition is getting suppressed, goes away about this critical pressure. The numbers are a little bit different, just a little bit higher. So, um, and then SC2 goes away, can't be tracked. Does it extend all the way out to here? Maybe, but it's just really hard to see. And then what we labeled ferromagnetism here, and I'll note right now uh, as we go on that there are arguments that it's not actually ferromagnetic. We don't actually have a direct measurement of the magnetic state there. So, what should we say? First of all, pressure decreases this. Um, this is an upper bound for superconductivity, okay? Maybe not surprising. Um, it's a sort of a first order phase transition. Superconductivity can't exist on the other side. But if we um, look in more detail at the temperature dependence and uh, the temperature field dependence, remember that there was this kind of a funny shape. And then it, it um, let me put it this way. If we took the, um, the initial slope, which is some, uh, an exercise that one often does with uh, type two superconductors and just extended the, uh, or, or took like what we might theoretically expect to be the upper critical field, these values would be really, really high. Um, and what it looks like is that this, this magnetic transition in field just gives the superconductor a haircut. And so it really looks like it's limiting um, the superconductivity on the high field side. Okay, and the last thing um, that I will talk about is um, this the pressure dependence of the Lazarus phase. So now, instead of looking here along the B-axis, where this is the phase diagram, we're now looking along this special range of angles where we see the very high field reentrant superconductivity. And I just wanted to also mention that we were, in, we were very lucky to be able to get this data set. Um, this was measured in the 45 Tesla DC hybrid in Tallahassee, which is actually the highest field uh, DC field available in the world. Um, but we were able to get it done just before the COVID shut everything down. So um, it, it was nice that that happened. Um, here's what data look like. So from resistivity and from tunnel diode oscillator measurements, I am not going to force you to look at all of them. But I will note again, hey, look, these big jumps, just like we saw before, okay? So we're seeing things that are similar to the previous data set. Um, but I want to make it easier for you to look at. So these are contour plots. And what I'm plotting, what I'm showing you here are the pressure dependence of two series. One is a diode oscillator measurement. The other one is resistance measurement. They're at slightly different angles uh, with respect to field because the samples were turned a little bit. Um, and they give us the ability to, to focus on a couple things. Um, one is that at 0.85 GPA, I'm just going to make a qualitative statement. I'm going to show you a picture in the next slide. Um, you'll notice here that this is a zero resistance state in re all the way up to 45 Tesla. So even more impressive than 35, like just to see the experiment is really pretty cool. But uh, let's, let's now uh, take a look at what's happening to this uh, magnetic transition that separates the FP state from the lower uh, field uh, normal paramagnetic state. It's going down again, as the red arrows show you. Okay, that's not a shock, right? Uh, you see it here too. But what's happening is that the lower field superconducting state is actually getting in enhanced, right? And along this direction, the superconductivity isn't kissing the bottom of that magnetic transition yet, at least not at ambient pressure. But what is happening is that the upper uh, field superconductivity, this Lazarus phase, is 
kind of uncovering as this field trend, as this transition gets pushed down. And you'll notice it in the bottom data set too, right? This line is basically almost like, uh, I don't wanna say squeegee, but it's, it, as it moves down, it's, it's letting the, the upper field super, the higher field superconductivity live, and it's going to kill the lower field superconductivity. And then there's this extra feature called, that we call A for anomaly that I'll talk about in uh, two slides. All right, so I, I mentioned that I was gonna show you again, a zero resistance state. Now in this case from 12, because that's the typical minimum field that we can measure here. But this is basically saying you've got a, you know, zero resistance all the way up to 45. Important caveat here is I'll just flip back. This really looks like it's happening in two different superconducting states. So it's cheating a little bit, but nonetheless, experimentally remarkable. Um, and remember I talked about a couple slides ago the, that there's this uh, hysteresis in the resistance um, in, in uh, some of the low field behavior near the magnetic transition. Well, there's hysteresis in this data set too. So it looks like we've got sets of first order transitions kind of all over the place. Um, why is a different question? I'm just giving you sort of the qualitative overview here and I will not claim to understand everything. There's a lot going on. Um, and let's look over here now at um, the data set uh, with what I'm calling the anomalous or anomalies at high field. So I'm sorry, I'm gonna flip back and give you a little bit of uh, uh, motion sickness. Remember at high fields, I'm sorry, at high pressures, there's an emergence of uh, some new feature that we don't see at lower pressure. And actually uh, we're comparing it here. So this is the TDO data uh, plotted as one over H already uh, assuming something here. Um, the superconductivity, is, this is now at different temperatures. Uh, it becomes stronger. That is the, the amplitude of this uh, frequency shift gets bigger as you cool it, which is consistent with the going to the zero resistance state. And then at, at lower fields, uh, there's another thing there that looks like it's doing something similar. Um, and so this is the resistance plot that corresponds to this. This is really superconducting. This is not. And so what is that? Well, if we believe our one over H actually meaningful, and the reason we plotted in the first place is that this might be indicative uh, or it might reflect the fact that this, uh, this could be Landau levels, okay? Um, I am not going to try to sell you on this idea, but um, Landau, having superconducting Landau levels is another way that one can get high field superconductivity. It's another way to potentially break the orbital limit. Um, problem here, of course, is that this isn't superconducting. So that might be because the levels are broadened, so they're scattering too much. And um, another troubling, uh, or rather thing we would have to contend with is that the frequency, if we took it literally, would indicate that this Fermi surface that is doing this is really small um, and kind of too small for calculations to support. All right, so uh, to, to sort of put it all together, these two directions, what is pressure doing? It's taking this high field transition and suppressing it to zero field. And the basic fact now is that uh, from the low field side, this, this magnetic transition always uh, limits the low field superconductivity. And on the high field side, where you have this superconductivity, it's the low field limit. Of it. So it's a boundary between two different regimes. Okay, and does this make sense? Yes. Um, if we compare to example uh, for, to, to, meta, to magnetization data um, at ambient pressure, if we look at the magnetization along the B with for field along B, we'll note that this, um, this field, uh, 35 Tesla, where this is a step, this corresponds to where the magnetization along the B axis actually becomes bigger than the magnetization along the A axis. Similarly, under pressure, when one is above the critical pressure, the magnetization along the B axis actually becomes bigger in the long A. So it becomes the easy axis, so to speak. So that entire phase transition corresponds to a switching in the magnetic easy axis of the material. Um, I will, I think I've got a, a couple minutes here. So let's go over just some open questions. I won't dwell on them. You're, you're welcome to ask me questions at the end about them. Um, one question, one first question is um, that there is what I call a large residual term in the heat capacity here. 
here. So experimentally, uh, when one when a material when a metal goes superconducting, it exhibits a big anomaly, and then we expect that this thing will go down to zero when plotted even at c over t. Um, this material doesn't. In fact, uh, pretty I won't say universally, but there's very small scatter in the this residual term between uh, samples made by us and different groups internationally. Um, it's a pretty large residual part. It might indicate, or it would seem at first uh, glance to suggest that there are unpaired electrons uh, there. But as I'm going to talk to you about, that's not actually what we think is happening. In fact, we don't really understand it. But um, if we measure thermal conductivity in the system, that actually, um, one tells us that the uh, superconductor is unconventional, but two, um, there is a term in the thermal conductivity that is proportional to the specific heat. And the thermal conductivity actually looks like there shouldn't be a residual term in the specific heat. That tells us that this large low temperature specific heat um, is coming from something that we don't quite understand. What we can say is since it doesn't contribute to the thermal conductivity, that it's probably not itinerant electrons. So it's probably not unpaired carriers. We say, oh, that's good. Well, at least one... You're not, you, don't, you don't have a weird situation where not all the electrons are participating in the superconductivity. Nonetheless, that's an open question of what's going on. Okay, point two, what is the sample dependence of this behavior, of this superconductivity? Um, and I'm just showing you here uh, from the Japanese uh, French collaboration, well, their first paper, they already showed that, hey, we, we made this material by a certain technique called flux uh, synthesis, and we don't get superconducting samples at all. So that's, you know, that's a black and white type of dichotomy, but there is variation in the transition temperatures. And right now we're working on uh, understanding better the relationship between how crystals are made, what, you know, whether they're crystallographic or stoichiometric differences and, and the superconductivity. Um, another thing, and I, I, I told you that all our samples have double transitions. Well, many other groups make uh, crystals where they only can see a single transition. And this is turning into, or this is uh, also an open question with um, a actually big, big uh, theoretical implications because there's a question whether there are intrinsically one or two transitions. Um, here we go. Uh, this is actually what I just said. Um, there are other groups that actually can make samples with two transitions, and this is ongoing. And then um, to sort of beat this to death. Um, I mentioned that there's more than one transition under pressure, right? Um, and so a natural question, at least in my mind, is if we know that superconductivity, if everybody is confident, and this you know, is true, that there are two superconducting phases at finite pressure, how do these extrapolate back at low, temp at, at low pressure? Shouldn't we see two transitions also at ambient pressure? Not necessarily. So this is also a topic of ongoing research. And so to wrap it all up, um, I hope that if you remember a couple of things from this talk, one is that uh, uranium ditelluride is a superconductor that is chiral and breaks time reversal symmetry. Um, there are, there's a lot of really strange behavior, including superconductivity at very high fields and pressure um, does a lot in this system. There are, there's more than one superconducting phase under pressure. Um, but one thing that seems clear is that the application of pressure suppresses this high field transition and that this high field transition separates two different superconducting regimes. So um, I'll also, by the way, uh, thank you for your attention. And before I go to questions, I'd like to also uh, mention that there are uh, postdoctoral opportunities at NIST. So if you're a, a US citizen in particular um, and you are graduating soon, uh, I welcome uh, your interest. So thanks again, and I'm ready to take questions. Thank you, Nick, for the interesting talk. Do we have any questions from the audience? I have one. Yeah, Phil, go ahead. Um, when you talked about the inelastic neutron scattering and difficulty in distinguishing between the um, ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic phases, um, I'd have thought that the very different dispersion relations for antiferromagnetic magnons and ferromagnetic magnons would have shown up in the inelastic neutron scattering. But I guess 
I'm confused about something there, probably. Yeah, it, that probably just means my presentation was terrible. Um, so let me clarify. Um, okay. The first is that even before we talk about excitations, um, if there were long range magnetic order, neutron scattering should be able to tell you that because the diffraction pattern will change. So if there is an honest to goodness antiferromagnet, you would get new uh, magnetic Bragg peaks and it would be a done deal. What actually is seen is there are features in the inelastic um, spectrum. So at finite energy, finite momentum transfer um, that, that are there. Um, we're not even talking about the dispersions. You're just saying, hey, look, they're there. Not that they can't be measured, but there is nothing conventionally antiferromagnetic about them other than where they sit. Um, the flip side of that is that people have already looked for um, a si similar signatures or things that have been seen in other heavy fermion ferromagnets at appropriate wave vectors. That is, uh, things that are, uh, that are symmetrically equivalent to zone center, and they don't see ferromagnetic fluctuations in neutron scattering. And so the evidence for any ferromagnetic correlations is coming from um, USR measurements and uh, let's say from optical Kerr rotation right now. And then you could argue, well, USR doesn't tell you uh, the wave vector, right? It, you, know, you're, you look at the temperature dependence and assume a model and say this is consistent with. And so that is the argument that's being put forth. So uh, neutron scattering sees stronger susceptibility at antiferromagnetic wave vectors, but no order. And so now the question is, um, is that really what's participating in the pairing? And if so, how do you make sense of that? Thank you. Any other questions? Nick, I have a question. So you mentioned um, heavy fermions. So heavy fermion material has been, you know, has been studied for a long time, right? And I believe some, you know, were superconducting as well. Has there been like a discussion or proposal that uh, other heavy fermion materials are, could be topological superconductor? Yeah, yes. Um, and, and there are, are several um, that, let me put it this way. The ones that I, that I focused on, the uranium compounds, so uranium rhodium germanium and uranium cobalt germanium, are ferromagnetic. So they have a Curie temperature that's higher than a superconducting critical temperature. Those are in all likelihood spin triplet superconductors. Um, and they would seem to satisfy the requirements uh, for also being topological. Um, their problem is is that they, even though they've actually been studied for now 20 years, okay, um, I don't know of a single tunneling uh, experiment, uh, sorry, an STM experiment done on them. Their transition temperatures are lower, um, below about 1K. And so even though 1.6 doesn't sound that high, it's already easier to work on this material. Um, there are other materials like uranium platinum three, which looks like it has two uh, transitions that it also has a, a multi-component order parameter, um, and it it looks like it has a potentially a completely different um, pairing symmetry. It might be F wave, for example. I think is one of the going um, uh, models for it. And so maybe the thing is there are even though there are a handful of candidates, um, it's really difficult to prove, or it hasn't the same data set doesn't exist for the heavy fermion superconductors that exist, for example, in some of the proximity induced uh, systems that you would get in, from people who are studying topological states, or even let's say iron selenide, for example, right? So those kinds of experiments we would want to do and show uh, in UTE2, um, but for various reasons, they, they just haven't been demonstrated for the candidate materials in the heavy fermion world, even though they've been around for far longer. Okay, I see. Ash, uh, you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I do have a question, but it sort of sidesteps all the beautiful and really intriguing physics that you've been telling us about. It's really tangential. But I was wondering, um, you know, just about uh, what complications are caused by the fact that this is a you know uranium and uh, both 
in terms of doing experiments and potential applications? Oh, that's a wonderful question. So um, I, I would, like, I'm tempted to say none. Of course, that's not true. Um, there's regular, there are all, you know, it's harder to work with uranium in general. Uh, having said that, this is depleted uranium. And so it's the stuff that had, so the useful part, the useful isotope is 235. Mm -hmm. um, this has very little 235 in it. And that's great for us because we're not interested in radiation damage or anything like that. Uh, uranium by itself, actually, I mean, it's, it's just an interesting element because it has unpaired 5F electrons. Um, and, you know, we're not interested in working with protactinium or neptunium. So it's pretty stable. Um, you just need to sign more papers in order to use it. I, I'm, I'm maybe being a little bit uh, glib here. Uh, it certainly takes effort to start up um, a research effort to do it. But we have been able to send samples to many collaborators. So it's not like that is uh, a limitation. And people have been working on uranium compounds in physics for a very long time. Um, so it's financial and time penalties uh, in order to work with this. As far as making a device, let's say I want to make a quantum computer uh, and I'm just speculating. So I'm completely hypothetically, let's say that I can make a fault tolerant quantum computer, um, but I have to pay the price that it's made out of uranium. Uh, I, I'm fairly certain that uh, most governments would be okay with that um, trade-off. Uh, second thing is, let's pretend we wanted to put it in our cell phone in the far future because everybody has a quantum computer in their pocket. Um, the amount of material is, is tiny, right? If you really have a thin film qubit or something like that. So I don't really think that that's necessarily going to be an impediment. Uh, does it really mean we're going to have it in cell phones? I you know, you're going to have to cool it to 1.6 Kelvin. So you're probably not, but you know what I mean? So um, if we're happy with um, the, if we can shield it, it'll probably be okay. Um, and, and the real question is, of course, uh, or a question would be, can you find another element that's not uranium that would give you similar spin orbit coupling, et cetera, uh, that, you, that you could exploit later? Um, and as far as I know, uranium, <laughs> for whatever reason, seems to be giving us these interesting superconductors so far. So uh, that's where we are. Okay, great, thank you. I guess we should redouble our efforts then to prove that this is a topological superconductor. <laughs> yeah, and of course, I mean, just like with everything, there is a cultural skepticism. So some people are really, you know, interested in pursuing that, and others are like, don't be, you know, whoa. Uh, there have been failures before. Don't get too excited. And so it's, uh, you know, I would say that's not unusual, but. Uh, well, it's very interesting, whatever it is. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, yes, for sure. If even if you can't make a qubit out of it, I think it, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Should I? Hi, Nick. I have a question. So. Uh, it seems to me that the role that the spin fluctuation plays in this triplet superconductor is not yet clear. Yes. Yeah, right. And you mentioned the antiferromagnetic spin fluctuation. And so, so as, a, as far as I know, the antiferromagnetic spin fluctuation usually leads to a singlet a superconductor. So what is the mechanism that probably make? I don't know. Uh, I am, so, I mean, if you, the, the real question is like, I have the material, sorry, not I, but the material has some kind of spin susceptibility, right? And you mm -hmm. want to say, well, it's strongest at Q equals zero, so it will favor spin triplet pairing, or rather that's sort of the bias that we come in here for with, and um there are other things that are telling us that it looks like ferromagnetic superconductors, right? This reentrant part, we wouldn't understand the mechanism either in a, well, there are mechanisms, excuse me, in spin uh, singlet superconductors that can give you reentrance. But again, this is sort of superficial similarity. All seems to be pointing towards ferromagnetism. And yet neutron scattering says the strongest spin susceptibility looks like it's an anti-ferromagnetic wave vectors. So that's an experimental fact. Um, that doesn't give you a theory you know, an explanation for how antiferromagnetic spin fluctuations um, will give you spin triplet pairing. I think that, and you know, it, it's not a criticism of the experiments, but that means that that is a big thing that would need to be explained if that is actually true. Okay, thanks. 
I see Pino has unmuted himself. Yeah, Do you I have a, I, yeah. I have a quick question. Thank you, Nick. Uh, fascinating physics. Uh, really appreciate that. I have a, a sort of curiosity more than a question. When you talk about your pressure dependence of your properties there, it seems a very intriguing piece of physics also. But uh, I wanted to uh, understand a little bit better what you know triggered it, you know, to you, to your mind, the fact that you wanted to apply this pressure to your material in order to tune the properties. Do you envision any application there? So what's the... Yeah, oh no, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, I, I can be, I, I, you know, I, I can jokingly say, well, because we have a pressure cell, but of course that, that's, that's way, that, that's not really uh, why. The, the first thing that occurred to me, and actually not just to me, but this seems to be an inclination. The first thing is, if we apply pressure, can we increase the superconducting transition temperature? This is just because of, you know, because there are many systems where this is true. Uh, it's not a given because sometimes the application of pressure will suppress superconductivity, but it is usually, you know, it's a first experimental question when asked. And, you know, we were, we were rewarded because the transition temperature went up by almost a factor of two. Uh, and of course, then it disappears. So the second part, the disappearance of it, that is fortuitous. Actually, as is finding this upper, you know, this really high field limit to it, and then essentially connecting the dots. I mean, you know, which happened over several years. But that's telling you something about the energy scales. And also, again, since, uh, I mean, the way at least I presented it, I hope you agree that there's a change in the magnetic state. So it's telling us already that uh, even the pressure energy scale, this is like 1.5 GPA, 15 kilobars. So it's mm -hmm. not really that big. That's the stability of this, um, of this superconductivity, right? It's kind of weird. Again, go back to this plot. Low temperature scale, high field scale, and kind of intermediate pressure scale. This is what characterizes the, the superconductivity. And that's sort of generally how I, I think about all of it. But yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's squishy, it's susceptible. And so we're actually really lucky, you know, because this is laboratory scale, uh, everything. Thank you. It's cool. Okay. I think in view of time, uh, we should uh, conclude the seminar um, here and uh, probably it can stay a couple more minutes and if anybody wants private discussion can stay. Thank you, Nick. Happy to stay.